So this morning, I want to talk to you about the love of God. This sermon is a sermon about the love of God. Now, having said that, there's probably no topic that's been preached on more than that. But I really felt led that that's what God wanted me to speak about today. Is about His love. And I want to get ahead of myself and say right now that in our country, in America, we have a gospel that overemphasizes the love of God. It puts so much emphasis on God's love that it takes away from the fact that God is whole and that He's perfect and that all His attributes are equal. That's why they fly around His throne saying, Holy, 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 because God is holy. He's completely perfect. But in our country, we love to talk about God's love because it's soft and it's easy and it makes us feel good and it comforts us in the place we're in. Nevertheless, it doesn't make it untrue that God is still love and that His love is powerful. So that's what I want to talk to you about. And this is what I wrote and I need you to listen very, very closely God has showed us more love that can ever be expressed. God's love surpasses our human comprehension and we're not able to summarize it or explain it or give it definition by our language because it just limits us. When I try to describe to you the love of God, I, I'm beginning to fail because I can't describe to you how powerful and how high and how great and how marvelous His love is. There are no words to magnify the love of God to the height that it deserves. Even in talking and preaching about the limitlessness and the immutability and the untouchable, unmeasurable searches of His love, it seems that we're bringing it down even to try and describe it. Because it's not something that can be mentally attained. You can't hear about the love of God and that, oh, okay, now I get it. It doesn't work that way. You understand that when we go to heaven and we're there for eons and time upon time and we're there for all of eternity and it doesn't end and it just keeps going, that it will just be a drop in the bucket as we start to understand the love of God. Amen. We'll be there for a hundred thousand years and it will just be a little pin hole of light in starting to comprehend the awesome love of God. Amen. Because God is limitless. So for all eternity, we'll begin to take in and absorb His attributes and His character and His virtue. And we'll just begin to rub the surface. That's an amazing thought. And to begin to describe His love is to just fall short. So it's not easy to preach on God's love. It's not easy to come and say, hey, God loves you. That has been used so many times that it just becomes flippant. It just becomes a casual saying. God loves you. That's great. What does that love entail? What did that love do for you and I? What sacrifice and what violence came about so that it could be demonstrated? God's love is not something that's flippant. I was thinking, you know, there's lots of cliches and adages and things that are trite, but you know the, the, the old saying where I asked God how much He loved me and He spread His arms on the cross and took the nails and said, that's how much. Amen. It seems a little light, but it's true. That sacrifice was for you and I. And it was a bloody one, and it was a terrible one, and it was a one that was filled with violence and hate, and it was one that had to be done. And that was the way God demonstrated His love. Amen. The awesome love of God in Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit and in God the Father comes more clearly into view when our view is a glimpse of where we came from or what we would have been Amen. without His touch. Amen. That applies to me. I was thinking, I was sitting in my office downstairs going, the love of God begins to really make a lot of more sense when I look back to what I was Amen. 
and to where I was and how I used to think and what I used to do and where I was headed without Him. We were all destined for hell without Him. We were all destined for judgment without Him. And, And I was destined not just for hell, but a life of misery and a life of loss and a life of addiction and a life of bondage. That's, that's what my testimony would have been without the grace of God, without the love of God. The love of God is, it means, that word love means to cherish, to hold something very dear. Passion, desire towards something, a deep devotion, a deep affection towards something. An affection so deep that it's more of a groan. And I was thinking about that concept. It's like when we tell God we love Him, or we really feel like we love Him, or we really begin to reciprocate love with the Almighty God, it's not even something that can necessarily be put into words. It's something that's expressed deep down inside, and that's called worship. Worship. Just a groan that comes deep down in your belly and just comes flowing out. It's not eloquence of words. It's not things that come flowing out of your mouth. It's just a life in stillness where you just yearn for Him and you just love Him with all your heart. And that's always what He's been giving us from the very beginning. Before time, before time was a concept, before times beyond time, He saw us and He knew us and He loved us. Listen to Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet preventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth His love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While you were yet spitting in His face, Christ died for you. While you were deep entrenched in your sin, shaking your fist at a holy God, Christ died for you. When I was undeserving, and the only thing I did deserve was crucifixion on a cross, Christ died for me. And He died for you. Turn to John chapter 3, the Gospel of John chapter 3. John chapter 3, and then go to verse 16. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. The world through His love and His sacrifice and His fulfillment of the covenant and the plan that He had foreordained from the foundation of the world might be saved. You understand, it wasn't only love. Jesus didn't die for us just because of love. But the cross was a demonstration of God's love. That's what the Bible calls it. God demonstrated His love for us by giving His only Son. It was a demonstration of, how much do I love you? Enough to allow the one I love a lot more than you to be tortured and brutally murdered. That's how much I love you. That's a passionate, amazing type of love. I put myself in those shoes, not taking away, not trying to bring God down, not trying to belittle what's happened, but I put myself in that shoes. Would I give my son to be beat to death before my very eyes, punched in the face and all his hair ripped out and scourged and whipped and kicked and spit on and stand there and watch? No, I would not. You'd find a big ugly bear coming after you. Amen. I would not do that. I don't know if I'd be able to do that. I don't know if I could physically and emotionally restrain myself. But God did that for you and I. And not only did He watch, guess what He did? He went like this. He turned His back when His Son took all of our sin. Because God can't look at sin. 
Why? Because he's holy. He's holy. He's holy. He's unmixed. He's pure. He can't be. And when this is a, a, a rabbit trail, but let's chase it for a second. Jesus had proximity to sinners, not proximity to sin. Amen. Do you understand me? There is a whole dispensation in our age that and I'm not picking on anybody. I'm not. But we can look like the world. We can get tattooed up like the world. I can get pierced everywhere. I can dye my hair whatever color I want. I can look just like the world and still be close to Jesus. Amen. And I'll clarify. I have lots of friends with tattoos from heck to breakfast. Okay? <laughs> and they love the Lord. Okay? Amen. So I'm not picking on him at all. But the whole concept is deep down in your heart. How close can I stand like Lot to the world and still be called a son of the Most High? How close can I get to sin? That was never Jesus' heart. His love was to get right smack dab close to the sinner so that they could experience life. They could experience love. It wasn't close to sin. It was close to the sinner. Jesus did not mind to plot down and sit right next to a prostitute and talk to her and tell her and fellowship with her and say, I love you and God has a plan for you and there's a destiny. I am he. I'm he who is spoke of. And I'll give you rivers of living water. He didn't care about the sin that was in the person. He loved the person. Amen. And he came to deliver them from sin and sickness and slavery and sorrow. That's why he came. And it wasn't about his proximity to sin. It was proximity to the sinner. Because he came to make to break the chains and the bondage of sin. Amen. So if somebody tells you that you can be close and you can rub up against sin, you tell them, no, my Bible doesn't teach that, but it teaches I can come right up to the sinner and give him a big fat hug and a kiss right on the cheek and tell him, God loves you and I love you and I've experienced in a small portion, a thimble full of God's love, I've experienced and it changed my life. Amen. And it set me free and it made me free. He didn't come to condemn the world, but He came that the world might be saved through Him. Yeah. Saved through the demonstrated love of God by putting His Son to death and allowing it to happen. That's how it could, we could be saved. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're talking about the love of God this morning. That God would truly just make it real to you. Did He begin to open your eyes and unstop any ears and begin to take away the, any preconceived notions you had about the love of God and that you would just begin to understand in light of the Scripture. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for how many? All. To be testified in due time. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that the world through him might be saved, that whosoever believes in him. It says in my Bible that he gave himself a ransom for all all there's also a concept that we'll run into where jesus died for a select few he died just for the ones that he knew would love him he only died for those the blood his blood only covers those what does the scripture say it says he gave himself a ransom for all that he so loved the world. And it says Amen. that he doesn't desire for any to perish, but all to come. Amen. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For all. Do you understand that? Okay. Because there's lots of false teachings that are going to come up in these last days. They're going to try to tell you that Jesus didn't die for all. Mm -hmm. He did. All will not receive him, and most will go to hell. That's also what the Bible teaches. But his love is not limited. God's love is not a jigsaw puzzle piece upon the globe. That I love this nation. Oh man, those people in North America, they started because of Christopher Columbus came there, and they're just my special people. So I love them, but I don't love these other people. I don't love them because their whole culture started 
because of something pagan and wicked and they worship the sun and the moon and they used to eat their neighbor. I don't love them. That's not true. It's not true. God's love is limitless. He desires all men to be saved and he gave himself a ransom for many. I'm going too slow. I'm going to speed up. 1 John 4, chapter 9. Or verse 9, in this was manifested the love of God towards us because God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. This is 1 John chapter 4. We would not know love. Listen carefully. We would not know love, but due to the fact that God loves us and gave himself as a ransom for sin. We would not experience or understand love unless it originated in the heart of and the mind of the Trinity. The love of God in Jesus Christ was demonstrated by the sacrifice that was demanded in blood. Jesus did not die only for love, but it was the most powerful demonstration of God's love for you and I. There could be no more powerful demonstration of how much He loves us to allow the one He loved from the foundations of time to be murdered for you and I. There is no greater way to express love than sacrifice, than pain, than surrender. Amen. I can talk to you married people. <laughs> There's no greater way to express love than sacrifice and self-denial and laying your life down. Amen. By taking the wrong. I am not one who's able, and it's not easy for me, to take the wrong. Can I just pick on myself? I'll pick on myself all day long. It's not easy for me to lay down my life. It's not easy for the flesh to say, you know what, I don't have to be right. I just love you and we'll get through it. I don't need to be right. Because this guy, he wants to be right. You know, I'm not always right, but I was never wrong, you know. You know, that's a hard concept that God has us lay our life down. Lay your life down. Turn the other cheek. Let yourself be defrauded. It's all through the New Testament. Be defrauded. It's okay. Let somebody talk about you and make up dirty rumors and just turn the other cheek and say, God knows. Amen. He sees my character. He knows who I am. Amen. It's okay. You don't have to be understood. You understand that? That you don't have to be understood? You don't have to make yourself understandable to somebody. No, this is why. No, this is why I did it. This is what I think. This is who I am. That's not important. God knows who you are. Amen. God loves who you are. Amen. You know who he loves more than who you are? He loves who he's making you into Amen. more than that. Yeah. He's taking you from here to there. And point A to B is not a straight line in the kingdom of God. Amen. He's taking you from there to there. And he loves that he's forming you into the image of his son. That's why he died, for fellowship, for communion, to bring us back. So no man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby we know that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he's given of us his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So whosoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God... God lives in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love of God that God hath towards us. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so we are in the world. There's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Amen. Listen to me very carefully. This is a concept that I want you to understand. Something that God started showing me a few years ago. Listen. Do you understand that the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, were in the heavenlies. They were in the cosmos. They always were. They were created beings. They always were. Almighty. And do you understand? They were in communion. They were in a love relationship. The triune God was in a love relationship. If we had one God like Allah, where would love come from? 
where would the concept of love originate? There would be no such thing. Who would one God love? Mm -hmm. Himself? There was a trinity that was in a relationship and that shared love and that understood the concept of covenant communion. So that's where we understand what love is. They loved one another and now we see what love is. We understand the concept of relationship because we have a relational God. Amen. You get that? Do you understand how powerful that is? We have all these religions based on this one person who had all this light or this one person who experienced nirvana or this one person who some angel appeared to and now they have all the understanding. That's just one person. Where's the concept of relationship come from? Amen. Where's the concept of love come from? Where's covenant and walking together in communion come from? It's not a concept in that framework. But our God was, he's really smart, isn't he? Amen. He really had it all figured out, didn't he? And we don't. And it's hard to understand the limitlessness of God's love. That notion of that idea would not exist without God's design. You see, the first love relationship demonstrated love by allowing the one he loved before time and before times of times to be killed for you and I. That was the almighty demonstration of love. You see the gravity of that statement? We love him because he first loved us. There's been such an overemphasis on the love of God. And the emphasis is not one that focuses just on God's love to talk about the purity and the power and how amazing it is. It's an emphasis on God's love in our country because we don't want to talk about God's other attributes. We don't want to talk about his wrath and his justice and judgment and that he's holy and that you bring spot and blemish in his sight. He can't have it because he's holy. We don't want to talk about his faithfulness, his faithfulness to his promises that will condemn those because he's faithful to his word and he makes covenant that he keeps it, that he keeps his word. We don't want to talk about all the other attributes of God that make him whole and perfect in every way. We would rather talk about the soft, easy things instead of see Him as a whole and see Him as perfect. And the love of God, if I could be so pretentious and ostentatious to say that if, the, if God was a pie chart, the love of God would just be one sliver of it. His love would be one and then we'd have faithfulness and justice and judgment and wrath and holiness and truth. And it would go on and on for all eternity. And he'd be perfect in every way. He's not a pendulum that swings one way and then swings the other. Amen. Today I'm full of wrath and I'm going to drop a piano on your head. And now today I'm full of love and I'll give you grace to walk through the day. That's not the God we serve. It says he doesn't change. Amen. I therefore am the Lord and I change not. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. Good luck trying to divide the God from the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's one of my pet peeves. Is when people try to talk about, oh, we serve a New Testament God. I didn't know that we had a God 2.0 now. I didn't know that the old one retired. I didn't get the memo. It's the same one. It's the same God. It's the same concepts. It's the same truth. You want revelation? Find Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. He's all over the place. He's everywhere. And the love of God is not just found just because Jesus died. Because what does it say? It says he was crucified from the foundations of the world. His blood was shed from the beginning. God knew. Amen. The Old Testament God knew that the New Testament Jesus was going to die for you and I. He wasn't different. He didn't change his ways. It's like, oh man, I've been too harsh with all these sacrifices in the Old Testament. We got to fix this. Let's have a powwow in heaven and figure out how we can fix this. That's baloney. We bring him down. We try to understand him. And we bring him down to our level where we can try to understand. Well, I understand that he understood it all long before there was a star in the sky. He knew. He had the plan. There was already love there. He already loved you and I. Formed and fashioned our lungs and our breath and our hair color and our eye color in our mother's womb long before daddy ever met mama. He knew. Amen. 
And he knew and he loved that person. He was designing that person. He's not changed. He's the same. I believe that David was filled with the Holy Ghost. Old Testament. Amen. I believe there were men, Elijah was filled with the Holy Ghost. The love of God is not strained. It hasn't changed. It's the same. He demonstrated his love towards us. You know, we think that there's this difference or that, you know, we can, when we do, because we're fallen, so we overemphasize attributes of God. We do, because we're fleshly. We'll bring out this one part of God or this one part of God or this attribute of God. And, but the truth is that he is complete. And we can only take it in piece by piece and little by little. We can't grasp our head would explode, right? Proverbs 11.1 1 says, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Diverse weights and diverse measures, both of them are alike. They're an abomination to the Lord. Does that make sense? God is not way heavier on one side Amen. and then he comes this way or he swings this way and swings this way. Diverse weights are an abomination to the Lord and a false balance is not good. Perfectly balanced. You know that word holy, H-O-L-Y, came from the word whole, whole, holy, complete, perfect, no mixture, no spot or blemish, perfect. I don't want to preach really long today, but I want to share something with you that I think God showed me. And this was, well, I preached this message backwards. This is where I started, and this is what I believe God began with. So turn with first to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This was the scripture that God was impressing on me through the week. In 1 Corinthians Chapter 13, the Apostle Paul talks about love. He begins to explain love. And in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love or charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith and I could remove mountains and have not love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned I, and have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Love vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. It does not behave itself unseemly. It doesn't seek its own. It's not easily provoked. It thinks no evil. It rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never fails. Remember how we could not know love unless it was demonstrated to us, right? So I want to read this passage, and I want to read it from a different perspective. I want to read it from a perspective that I felt like Maybe it would be God's perspective, how we'd read it if this explanation was coming from the heart of God. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels I have, and have not love, I become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and have all faith, so I could move mountains, I have, and have not love, I am nothing. See, Love suffers long, in verse 4. God's love has suffered long because He covered you with righteousness. When you earned a cross, even though you spit in His face, His love suffered long and pursued you. His truth rescued you until you bowed the knee. It says that love is kind. He showed you more kindness than you ever deserved or ever comprehended you could deserve. When you were yet a sinner, his kindness blessed you with life and love and goodness. It says he causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. He's good to the good and the wicked. His kindness is upon all his creation. His love and his kindness was towards you. It says that love envies not. You were his from the foundations of the world. 
Before he formed the sun and the moon and the stars, he knew you. And he's not a man that he envies you as a possession, but you were always his. And he is ferociously jealous for the relationship with you. That he has paved the way with his own blood. Love envies not. God's love, he's always owned you. And he has a plan for you. Love vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. So love, the love of God is not arrogant and it's not haughty. His love was so powerfully humble that he obediently bowed himself to the death on a cross. And like a lamb, he opened not his mouth. That's how humble and not haughty the love of God was. He didn't speak a word to defend himself, but died for you and I. All power was his in heavens and earth. The earth was his footstool and he could have called legions of angels, but he was murdered by his created creation. His love was not puffed up. Love does not behave itself unseemingly or seeks its own. It's not easily provoked and it thinks no evil. His love came as a servant. Jesus said, I came to serve, not to be served. Love is not something that seeks its own. It's not easily provoked. As they stoned him and they threw things at him and they stuck him on a cross and said, prophesy to us, which one of us struck you? It says that love is not easily provoked. And he demonstrated his love that was not easily provoked. And guess what? Love thinks no evil. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Love thinks no evil. His love became a servant. It says, How precious are your thoughts towards me, O God. How great is the sum of them. In Psalm 139. Love rejoices not in iniquity, but it rejoices in truth. His love was so passionately violent, fighting against sin and falsehood in a dying world. That he knew there was only one way. There was only one way designed to do away with the slavery and the iniquity that bound us. His love sorrowed over the unbelief. And he died to restore relationship. Love rejoices not in iniquity, but it rejoices in truth. He didn't rejoice. He rejoiced in the fact. It says that Jesus went to the cross for the joy that was set before him. What was the joy set before him? Restoring right relationship. What is eternal life? That they might know God and Jesus Christ, the Son whom He sent. That's eternal life. That's what it says in John chapter 17. Love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. The God of hope fill you with joy and peace. May you truly experience His love in believing that you would abound in hope. That's Romans chapter 15. It bears all things. He bore our iniquities. He bore our sorrows. He bore the slavery. He bore all those things. And he believes. And he says he ever lived us to make intercession for you and I. Love never fails. Love never fails. And in Jude chapter 1 it says, Keep yourselves in the love of God looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Keep yourselves in the love of God. And with this, I close. It says in 1 John that there's no fear in love. Fear hath torment. But those are made perfect in love have no fear. When we begin to really grasp the love of God, that it doesn't have limits, that it was passionately destined we were destined in his heart from the foundation of the world. You were going to breathe because he saw you and knew you. His love is not strained. It doesn't have limits. And we begin to understand it. There's no fear in that. There's no fear in love. And I, I was thinking about all the hardship that's coming upon our world right now. Disasters, wars and rumors of wars how it would be easy to fear. But I know that there are some that are struggling in great, horrible, terrible, tragic circumstances. And the love of God still fills their heart. Amen. 